let's go to that word this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. Let's stand up. We'll read the word together. Paul writes, for we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord, and we love it. Bam. When I, was a, when I was younger, high school, college, I used to play this like slapping game where you'd have someone stand there and you'd try to move your hands without them getting slapped. I tried to explain it to you, but it'd be easier if I showed it to you. So, Zach, come up here. I want to use you as an example this morning. Give it up for Zach. Are you? Yeah. So, so here's the deal. You stand there yeah. with your hands by your side. I'm putting my hands here in prayer-like fashion. I can't separate them. It's like they're super glued together, okay? And I want you to just slap my hand. Not that hard. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'm going to try to move it. So go ahead and do it again. So, okay, when you miss, it's my turn. So you get, now you just missed. Okay. So now you just said, okay, there you go. go. So that, there. Like, no, you're not, th- you can't move your, okay. So that, let me, I, I got to do it one more time for each of you. All right, go ahead. Okay, you missed. All right, now my turn. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, ready, ready? All right, hey, come here. Come here. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't think I hurt your hands, but you're, you're a Biola student, you can handle it. So this, this isn't a game just of reflexes, it's, a, it's actually a game of perplexes. Because it was perplexing for Zach, he didn't know when I would move my hand, he didn't know if it was going to come from the right side, it was going to come from the, the left side. Um, and it sets off, I mean, if you play it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a microcosm way, it sets off this little stress um, defensive mechanism within you, like, what's, when's it going to happen, I don't want my hand to be slapped. I gotta move it really quickly, and so you begin to get kind of get feel that tightening up inside you, and you feel this sense of perplexion. Perplexion is actually a word I made up; it's not really a word, but Zach was feeling that, and this is a, like a really bad segue, but that's what Paul is getting at there in Second Corinthians passage, saying that you know what we go through life; we're gonna be perplexed. There are perplexing things that are going to come our way. And when Paul wrote this, he was basically saying, you don't know how things are going to unfold in your life. That's perplexing. And he also said that it's going to happen to us. And he's talking to the early church. There were faithful Christians back then that were frankly perplexed. They didn't know what was going to happen in their lives. And Paul is basically saying, you know, it's, God's word gives you permission to be perplexed. I know we don't like to think that we should be perplexed, but perplexed is not the same as despair because he said you, you can be perplexed, but you, you're not going to despair. And I think sometimes we think, I don't want to be perplexed because it comes across like I'm, I'm fragile or I'm weak or something. And maybe that's why the word perplex has not been used that much recently. Google has this research tool that shows how words have been used over the last 200 years, and there you see how the use of the word perplex since 1800 to 2000 has gone down dramatically. And I don't know why, but maybe it's because we don't want to admit that we're perplexed. But we are. And we can be perplexed. So why are we perplexed? And what do we do about it? Well, first, we can be perplexed by the unknown. You know, go back to that whack-a-hand game. Those on the receiving side, when they're moving their hands like this, they're not sure where the slap is going to come from or when it's going to happen. I didn't tell Zach, I'm going to do it now. And I didn't tell Zach which hand I was going to use. But he waited and he wondered and he looked me in the eye and he tried to move his hand to avoid it. Maybe a little tense, maybe a little edgy. See, the unknown that we face brings lots of uncertainties and they are perplexing. Maybe you feel perplexed right now. Where am I gonna go to college? Can I handle the pressure of college? What if you fail at something? Will your money last? Will I get a job when I graduate? Will I ever marry? Will my paper that I'm working on right now when Corey is talking this due right after chapel be done in time? I don't know what your questions are. But there are a lot of perplexions, again, my own word. And when we fear what we do not know, 
and we fear what might be coming, sometimes we become perplexed. And that fear of the unknown sometimes causes us to imagine the worst. Last spring, some of you remember, we had Jonathan Haidt here. Jonathan Haidt is this uh, NYU um, social psychologist. And he talked about catastrophizing. Catastrophizing is an irrational thought a lot of us have in believing that something is far worse than it actually is. Either making a catastrophe out of a current situation or imagining making a catastrophe out of a future situation. And sometimes I, I, I do this. When some, one thing doesn't go right, I, I imagine the worst. And maybe you've done that too, right? You fail a quiz in a class. And you think, oh no, I'm gonna fail the exam. I'm gonna fail the course. I'm not gonna finish the semester. I'm gonna drop out of college. I'm never gonna get a job. I'm gonna move back in with my parents until I'm 50 because I failed that quiz, right? That's catastrophizing. That's taking one thing, extrapolating on that, imagining the worst. We catastrophize in our imagination when things don't get right and it's perplexing. Wondering when at any second that hand slap is gonna come from the left or from the right. And we can become perplexed by uncertainties. It's very natural. We can also become perplexed because we feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. Maybe for you, it's, it's you've overcommitted. You've said yes to too many things and it's overwhelming. That's a struggle for me too. I have very weak no muscles. You know, saying no to things. I easily say yes, overcommit. And for all the right reasons, you do this, I do this, we commit to things so that they begin to compound on us and it becomes perplexing. And these accumulated commitments, they wear on us. And we long for this relief, this this break, spring break, graduation, the end of the semester, whenever it might come. I don't know, maybe for you it's your course load. Maybe it's the part-time jobs you have. Maybe it's your leadership roles that you have at Biola. Maybe it's your NCAA schedule. Maybe it's student government or late night RAing or writing for the chimes that you've just done too many things and it's beginning to weigh on you. And if so, let me, let me just give you a little avuncular advice. That's like uncle-like advice. Like don't undersleep. Like, talk to some students on the way over here. They said they got six hours of sleep last night. That's good, but maybe not enough. Manage your time, like eat well, eat like healthy meals. Study during the prime of the day and not study during the middle of the night. It's just some advice. Sometimes being perplexed by overcommitments um, leads you to making unwise choices. But make wise choices. Limit the opportunities that you have in which you keep saying yes. Discipline your time the time on your phone, time playing video games. Learn to be okay with being bored for a period of time every day. Schedule into your calendar like going for a walk or or, or time alone to think and to pray and to ponder. Spend more time scheduling your priorities and prioritizing your schedule. Write into your schedule blocks of time when you're like actually doing nothing. Spend time with friends who can give you balance and perspective and take advantage of Bible's Counseling Center or our pastoral team. That Galatians passage about bearing each other's burdens, it's, it's, like, it's for your health, it's for your friend's health. Take that passage seriously. I might add that when you're going through college, there are perplexing ideas that you're gonna encounter, ideas that you haven't thought about before that will stretch your mind and will strengthen you also in your Christian worldview. But what about the heavy stuff? That stuff that's like outside of your control that you have nothing that you can do about it. My friend Gabe Lyons of Q Conversations recently said this, men are having sex with robots. Evangelicals are losing credibility. Kanye is going off. Vaping is harming our teens. The church is uninformed. Christians are losing confidence. Socialism is gaining popularity. Identity politics are king. Tech is exploding. Guns are up for grabs. Nationalism is spreading. Gen Z wants to change. And being woke isn't about your alarm clock. It's nothing new. Augustine back in the fifth century had no idea how am I supposed to live as a follower of Jesus in this pagan world. But he said, it's okay. I don't always need to know how to live. I just need to live. 
And he just lived as Christ-like as he could, even though it may have been countercultural. Here's what Augustine said. He said, right is right, even if no one is doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. And as our world changes, and it's changing so rapidly in front of us in ways that maybe are hurtful or saddening on so many levels, like our job as a rising generation is to, to, to be antidotes to that, all that is wrong, to be repairers of the breach, to be able to figure out how do we restore that which is broken. But we can't fix everything. We need to accept there's some areas that we cannot change. It's just the way it'll be, so we can't feel that that weight of perplexion is upon our shoulders. But we don't need to conform to those perplexing trends in our world. We just need to be faithful to Jesus. And third, we can be perplexed by big decisions. Some decisions are like really easy. When I go to In-N-Out, I get a double-double, fried mustard, chopped chilies, pickle, no sauce, and a bun. Like that protein style no bun thing, that messy where your lettuce is a bun, like, like come on, give me a break. <laughs> Burgers are supposed to be on a roll. But many, like many decisions, you know, are, are not as obvious as a double, double. When I was thinking about where to go to college back in the day, I actually looked like this. Um, then, yeah, 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 it's a real tie. Um, <laughs> Practically choked me. But I, 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 you can take it down now. Um, yeah, thank you. But I, I narrowed down my decision to go, where to go to college to, to two. One was a small college in New England. One was a bigger university in the Midwest. And I had narrowed it down. I had worked, thought the whole thing. But I didn't know which one. So one Sunday night, I was wondering, like, God, what, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And we went to one of those churches where at the end of the service, like the preacher says, you want to come down and pray about something, come down and pray. There's an altar down there, Kleenex on the altar and all that kind of stuff. And I prayed. And I sensed that night that God was saying, we want, I want you to go to this college over this one. So, so I closed one door and I began walking through another. I was heading towards that bigger university in the Midwest and, and something happened a few months later where I began to have some questions about that commitment. At the 11th hour, I decided I wasn't going to go to that university. And it was so perplexing. I felt like, God, you told me this is where you wanted me to go. But I didn't go to that one. I didn't go to the other one. I kind of went to a third one. And now I see in retrospect why that happened. It was this perplexing season that one university I felt this peace about, and then it all changed. But I think sometimes when we have either a plan A or a plan B, in front of us, and that's all that we can see. Sometimes God has a plan C in mind. And he takes us down plan A in order to shut that door eventually and move us into plan C because in our own limited range of sight and the horizons of reality that we have, we can only see so far. God's saying, I might have something different for you, something better than you can even imagine. And as crooked as that road seems, God makes those crooked roads straight. He does that time and time again. He did it for me in going to that college that I didn't even think about when I knelt at the altar of that church on that Sunday night a long time ago when I was a senior in high school. Sometimes we think we know what the options are, but God's got something else. And he makes those crooked roads straight. Isaiah said, God makes crooked roads straight. Jesus quotes Isaiah saying, God makes a crooked road straight. And what looks so twisting and turning in the windshield when you look back over time in the rearview mirror, you see how God makes sense of the perplexing times in your life. God knew what I needed in a college more than I could see. By the way, I will say that choosing a college is one of the most important decisions of your life. It can influence what you do for a career, where you live, who your friends will be, the choices you make, what your values will be. And the changes that happen between the ages of 17 and and 22 are perhaps more profound than any other five-year period in the 80 or so trips around the sun that you're going to spend here on the earth. How will you discipline your time when you're in college? What are the decisions that you'll make? What will your habits be? 
how you navigate the heartaches, yours and others, how are you grappling with the perplexing questions in life. Talked to that about a student when I was in high school back in San Jose a number of years ago. He said, I want to go to college where I feel like this is where I want to be when I'm at my best. This is where I want to be when I'm at my worst. I listened to that junior in high school tell that story. I told that in chapel a few years later and I heard somebody yell out, that was me. He came to Biola. That's pretty good. How much will your life be defined by what happens to you in college, risk-taking? Will you live as a deep follower of Jesus or just some cultural Christian? These are a few of the questions that are answered during your college years. So these are the ways in which we can be perplexed. We can be perplexed by the unknown. We can be perplexed by the feeling the weight of the world on our shoulders. We can be perplexed by how do we make these big decisions. And we, we hear from Paul, we're going to be perplexed. We are a perplexed people. But how do we deal with the perplexed? Well, this is where I say that sometimes we, we can become the perplexed I. It's all about me. I fear what might happen. I can handle these, can't handle these responsibilities. I don't know which decisions to make. So the antidote to that perplexed I is to rearrange those 10 letters, which you know I like to do, and you get expel pride. I'm playing a lot of words with friends, I think. (laughs) In the times of perplexion, we don't need to slap Jesus talk on our own way of living life and call it Christian. We shouldn't settle for some cosmetic faith that's eggshell thin and cracks at the slightest of pressures. Living through our perplexions is helped by some of the wisdom I shared a little bit ago about, you know, get some sleep, eat right, have good habits, manage your time, make sure you've got affirming friendships that lift you up and don't tear you down. But more than anything, it comes from a deep dependence on Jesus. Being crucified with Christ so that you can say it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's what it means to expel pride. Surrendering to Jesus, how to live in a perplexing world. Removing the hyper-focus from yourself and trusting God with your perplexions. There's a former USC philosophy professor, he was actually on the board at Biola for a while named Dallas Willard. He says, this is the way we go through life, by doing this, abandon all defenses and abandon all outcomes. By abandon all defenses, he means don't worry about how you might be perceived Because, brothers and sisters, you are whole in Christ. In Jesus, you are enough. You don't need to add anything to it. And abandon all outcomes or don't try to control things. God is sovereign, even in the perplexing times of your life. But God gives you permission. It's okay to be perplexed. We read that right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And Paul gives us this list of things that we can expect in life. But he also gives us a list of things that we don't need to be afraid of. He said, I should expect to feel hard pressed. And that's okay because in Christ, I will not be crushed. I should expect to feel persecuted. But that's okay because in Christ, I will not be abandoned. I should expect to feel struck down. And that's okay because in Christ, I will not be destroyed. I should expect to feel perplexed. And that's okay because in Christ, I will not be in despair. We will feel perplexed, Paul says. This is the way it goes. And that's all right, to be a perplexed people, but we should not be a despairing people. And we do this by not resorting to catastrophizing when things happen our way that are perplexing, but living into God's desire that we never feel hopeless and never feel in despair. My prayer This is for Biola students, but you who are visiting need to know this. My prayer is that God moves sovereignly on this campus. And it begins with our willingness to surrender to Christ. Surrender our lives to his way. Expelling our own pride. And welcoming in Jesus. Not being content to live some kind of culturally appropriate form of Christianity. But loving Jesus in a way that calls us to radical obedience. This is my prayer. My prayer is the Holy Spirit convicts us 
and renews us. And as we surrender and as we repent, we become the people of God who are not crushed, who are not abandoned, who are not destroyed, who are not in despair. And we live this way, fearless and anointed people of God so that more of Jesus might be known through us to the ends of this earth. This is my prayer. And may God work in a way on this campus that helps the world that is watching see that there's something profound about these rising generations of Jesus followers that are willing to stand up for Christ as perplexed as they might be. They're not in despair. They're not abandoned. They're not destroyed and they're not crushed because we have our anchor in Christ. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.